Amen. Hey, um, I don't believe we did this, so I want to make sure we do it. And that is want to welcome back uh, our good friend, David Lynn, DL, and leading wor- in worship this morning. Very grateful for you, brother, and for the gifts that God has given you. Thank you for sharing them with us. Um, let me invite you to turn your copy of God's Word to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3 is where we are. Um, again, we're continuing in our series, and, and before we get into it, let me just say I am so impressed that so many people are here this morning for two reasons. One is uh, it is a dreary, icy, uh, unpleasant kind of weathery day out there, and it's also <laughs> the day when you had to spring ahead an hour and lost an hour of sleep. So, wow, uh, if I can just pat you on the back, let me just do that. Well done in, in being here. Um, We are, uh, as I said, continuing in our series in Romans, where we have been, and um, and so we are going to be today, oops, in uh, chapter three. We're going to be looking at verses twenty-one through thirty-one. Our focus is going to be on verses twenty-seven to thirty-one, and um, and just before we get there, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, you should be able to find a Bible near you. It'll also be um, up on the wall in a moment, but in those particular Bibles, you'll find Romans 3, where we are today in, uh, on page 941. So that's where we are today. Now, last week, um, we were looking at this uh, section, verses 21 to 26, and I shared with you that several people have uh, made incredible um, comments about this particular section uh, of, of the book of Romans. Um, things like this. Someone said, this is not just the heart of the book of Romans. This is the heart of the Bible. Um, someone else said uh, that this is the marrow or the heart of Christian theology uh, in this particular section that we looked at last week. And then one person, Leon Morris, a commentator, said this. He said, this is the most important paragraph ever written. Uh, huge high praise for what we have here. Now, what, what did it say? Well, it said before, uh, right, this, this paragraph, it said Paul had been given us the bad news, which was essentially that we're all guilty. Uh, Every one of us, both the unrighteous and the self-righteous, whether we are immoral people or uh, moral, quote-unquote, good people, um, we're all guilty before a holy and righteous God. So uh, he's been giving us the the bad news, and, um, and he says that there's no one who is righteous. No, not even one, he says. And, and, but then he gets to this paragraph, and then he says, he announces, he proclaims the good news. And the good news is that there is a righteousness available that doesn't come from us, but rather it has come from God. It's been manifested um, from God. And that righteousness is available to anyone, to everyone, um, everyone, that is, who believes and, and, and we looked last week at this whole idea of how we are justified. That's justification. We are declared righteous on the basis of what God has done for us through Jesus on the cross. Um, we have been redeemed. That is that redemption is to be purchased back or bought back from the bondage of slavery. And that comes through the propitiation, which is, as we said, not a word we use a whole lot, but that is to turn away God's wrath. And it is the death of Christ that did that, that turned away the wrath of God that we deserve. And so we looked at that, and it is indeed uh, an enormous, um, life-altering, world-changing paragraph because of what it announces and proclaims to us. So, uh, another way of summarizing that whole thing, and I really, I really like this, I came across this week, and that is this, and that is that what God demands, Christ provides. What God demands, Christ provides. And what Christ provides may be received by faith. Now, um, that's Paul's message. That's what he says in this paragraph. And, and my question for us today is this, and that is, if these things are true, then what difference do they make? Like, how does that change the world? How does that change any one of us? In what practical, specific ways does that uh, impact us? And so that's why I've titled today's sermon, and this might seem a strange title to you, but hopefully it'll make sense when we're done, The Revolutionary Effects of Justification by Faith. The revolutionary effects of justifi- justification by faith. So, 
Let's get into the text. I'm going to reread that section we looked at last time. I'm going to go from verse 21 and then go all the way into uh, through to verse 31 this week. So if you will, give attention to this reading from God's word. Paul says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, verse 27 to 31, where we're focusing our attention today, continuing to read, it says, Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? Um, And then it says, No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. This is God's word. And before we continue to unpack this, let's just stop right here and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us. Will you join me as we pray? Father, thank you so much for the clarity and the power of the truth that is in your word. I ask this morning for your help. Lord, would you help me as I unpack it, as I proclaim it, as I apply it? Would you help us as we listen? Lord, may your spirit give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive. We ask this, Lord, for your sake and our blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, the revolutionary effects of justification by faith. What in the world? What am I talking about here? Well, I, really what I want to do is answer two questions this morning. And the first one is, what is faith? <laughs> what is faith? And then the second one we will look at uh, a little bit later is, what are these revolutionary effects um, of justification by faith? What exactly is it? So let's start with this. What is faith? Well, this morning, you might be wondering who's going to be sitting here and what this is all about. My son said, Dad, what are the chairs doing up there? Let me explain. These are two chairs that represent two things. The first I'm going to call the do chair, all right? And the second one, and I realize I'm going to have to move my uh, stuff over there so that y'all can see. The second one is the done chair, okay? Let me move this so y'all over there can see too. All right. Now, what are we talking about here? All right. In the do chair, we might say we have the law of works. Okay. And then over here in the done chair, we have what we would call the law of faith. You can find those two expressions in our passage today, the law of works and the law of faith. So this chair is all about achieving In other words, I mean, it says, this is what we what? This is what we do. This is how we achieve, right? But this chair over here, this chair is all about not achieving, but rather receiving. It's about believing. So this is achieving. This is believing, all right? Or another way we might think about it is that uh, in this chair, it's all about trying, okay? It's what we do. But in this chair, it's all about trusting, you know, a few months ago, I, I did a survey over at, um, at the park, and as I was asking people, I'd say, how would you finish this sentence? A Christian is someone who, and so many of the answers that I received, really represented this chair. A Christian, a Christian is somebody who tries, a t- someone who, who does these things and so forth. Um, 
And so this is a little different over here. This is saying this is not a Christian. A Christian is not someone who tries or does, but rather someone who understands what has been done and is trusting in that thing that has been done by God through his son, Jesus. And so it's a very different understanding, these two chairs. Um, So another way we might think about it is that uh, this is what religion is, okay? This is the work of religion. Every, uh, in fact, you could say this. You may have taken a course on religion in college, and someone may have told you there are tens, hundreds of religions throughout the world. Um, But there are really, in in what the Bible tells us, there are really only two systems of approaching God. And these are the two systems. You either understand that your acceptance with God is on the basis of what you do, or it is on the basis of what God has done. All right. And so if you're looking at the religion of Judaism, it's about obeying the Ten Commandments. Um, it's about going to temple. It's about doing these different things. If it's Islam, it's the five pillars of Islam. It's the basic the things that you do. If it is Hinduism, it's coming to the temple. If it's Buddhism, it's, you know, in other words, every one of the religions, it's based on what you do. And even for some people who believe themselves to be Christians, they say it's based on going to church. It's based on giving. It's based on reading. It's based on um, you know, reading, you know, praying and all this thing. That's how I am acceptable to God. So that's everything that religion says. But over here we have, instead of religion, we have the gospel that says it's not on the basis of what you do, but rather it is on the basis of what God has done. All right. Now, finally, uh, I'll just say that in this chair, what we're saying is what we have here is do this and you will live. Do this and live. But then over here we have to telestai, which is the Greek word, the last expression that Jesus uttered on the face of the earth when he said, it is finished. So what we have in this chair is do this and live. And in this chair we have, it is finished. So this chair is very different than this chair over here. And this, I'll just say, in conclusion, is the default of the human heart. We all live and function and think and operate out of, well, if I'm going to be acceptable to God, it's going to be on the basis of the things I do or don't do. And so we find ourselves acceptable based on these things. And another way of saying is that this approach says, I obey and therefore I am accepted. But in this chair, it's very different because in this chair we are saying, it's what he's done. And I'm accepted, and therefore I obey. Two very different chairs. Let me ask you this morning, or let me tell you this morning, that everybody in this room, everybody in this world, everybody who's watching this online, you are right now in one of these two chairs. Right this moment. So my question for you is, which chair are you in? Are you in the do chair or are you in the done chair? So when we begin to talk about what is faith, we need to understand the difference between these two chairs. Okay? Now, let's continue. Um, Let's see, where am I? Oh, another thing I want you to know when we answer this question about what is faith is that, and, and that's this, and that is that faith isn't what saves us. Wait a minute, what do you mean it isn't what saves us? Uh, Aren't you saying the revolutionary effects of justification by faith? Justification, I'm justified by faith. Isn't faith, therefore, what saves me? No, it's not. You were justified, if you look in the passage, by grace. Through faith. You are, in other words, you're not justified. It's, It's not faith that saves you. It's God who saves you. It's Christ who saves you. Faith is not what saves you. Faith is the instrument, not the cause of our salvation. Okay? So it's important to understand that difference. A lot of times we can take our faith and we can turn it into something that we do. In other words, this is, I've got faith. And, and, and on the basis of my faith and what I'm, what I'm doing and by my believing, uh, my receiving, that's why I'm saved. No, faith isn't what saves you. It's rather you resting in, sitting in that which God has done. And so we need to understand that when we think about what faith is. Uh, listen to what the British pastor, the late British pastor, John Stott said about faith. He said, faith is the eye that looks to him. 
It is the hand that receives his free gift. It is the mouth that drinks the living water. In other words, what faith is, is a receiver. And he concludes by saying faith's only function is to receive what grace or rather what God offers. Okay? So we need to understand that faith isn't what saves us, but rather it's the instrument through which we receive that which does save us, which is God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness that comes through Jesus and his death on the cross. Another thing I think is important for us to remember about faith is that faith is a gift. We're told in the passage that we've been justified by grace as a gift. And faith is a gift that comes from God. It's not something that we brought to God, but rather something that God granted to us, and that is to see the truth and to believe it. So therefore, if you have come to understand and has experienced conviction about sin in your heart, then you need to know and be encouraged that that is because God has granted that to you. And if you comprehend that you are guilty and deserving of his wrath, that's not something that you naturally understand. That's something that we naturally resist. But if we comprehend that, and if we receive that, then that's an indication that God is granting to you the gift of faith. In fact, we sang about this uh, in this song, Come Ye Sinners. Here's what the words say. It says, Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. It says, All the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. And then it continues, it says, this he gives you. This he gives you, tis the Spirit's rising beam. Faith is a gift. That's what we need and that's what he gives to us. The other thing I would say about faith is that it's not about the size of your faith, but rather it is more about the object of your faith. It's not about the size. Like some people, you'll say, you know, you've got more faith than I've got. Um, you know, and they're comparing themselves and they say, I wish I had your faith. Have you ever heard anybody say that to you? Or maybe you've said that to somebody else. I wish I had your faith um, because your faith, you've got so much faith. Well, it's really not so much about the size of our faith as it is about the object of our faith. Let me give you an illustration. <clears throat> if I said to myself, you know, if I put a bunch of feathers on my body, then I know that if I if I flap my arms hard enough and I do the right things, then I could fly from North Carolina to London. And I might have this incredible size faith in the feathers and my ability to get there. I might have, we'll just say if we could quantify it on a scale of 1 to 100, I might have a, a 93 uh, quotient faith in the feathers that's going to get me from North Carolina to London. And, um, and then if you propose to me, you know, an alternative is that you could board an airplane and do a transatlantic flight from RDU to London, um, and I might, I might be trembling and scared because I'm terrified of flying in an airplane, and I might only have a, a, a five on the question of zero, of one to a hundred um, faith in, in, an, in an airplane to get me across the Atlantic all the way to London. And as you can probably deduce that it's really not going to be about the size of my faith, but rather the object of my faith that's going to get me to London, right? The same is true for us. Our faith is not about how much we have, it's about in what, in whom we have our faith. And that's clearly what we have here. Is your faith in what you've done, or is it in what God has, what you do, or what God has done? That's really our question here. So, what we see is that faith is not so much something that you do, but it's trusting in what God has done. All right, that moves me to the second question I want to answer or address and consider this morning. That is, what are these revolutionary effects of faith, of justification by faith? And Paul gives us three in this passage. The first one, uh, and I, I want you to see too, is that, you know, as we're asking ourselves, what difference does it make? Um, what does believing the gospel change? I'm going to give you my quick answer. <laughs> the difference that believing the gospel changes, uh, what, what difference that makes is it changes everything. It changes everything. But Paul gives us three right here in this passage from verses 27 through 31. The first one is found in verses 27 and 28. The believing the gospel changes, first, how you see yourself, he says. It changes how you see yourself. You say, Jeff, how do you, how do you see that? Let me just explain. Let's read verses 27 and 28 again. He says here, Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. So note, on a side here, 
boasting is excluded. Boasting is done for. Boasting is ended because of believing the gospel. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No. But by the law of faith. There you have the law of works contrasted with the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So, one way that believing the gospel changes us is it changes how we see ourselves. It changes how you see yourself. So how does that work? And why is it that Paul's bringing up this whole concept of boasting? Is Paul really, uh, you know, got a, got a thing against people who brag? <laughs> does that mean no trash talking anymore? Um, you know, no bragging. Is that, that what he's saying? Is he saying that we've violated the no bragging, no boasting rule? No, he says that's not what's going on, and it's not eliminated by, it's not upheld by this law that says uh, no bragging or no boasting. So let's stop and ask ourselves, what does he mean by boasting? Um, what exactly is, is behind that? Well, by boasting, what we mean is that it's bo- what you boast in is what you, what you have confidence in to go out and face the day. What you boast in is what you have confidence in to go out and face the day. It's the thing of which you say, I'm somebody because of this. And however you fill in the blank in that sentence that is what you boast in that is that is what defines you that is what you consider to be the reason for your worth the reason for your value the reason for your significance or even your identity and so that is your boast Um, it could be a whole bunch of things some of us it's like i want to be a success and that success is in something that you've done it's, it could be your vocation. It could be your education. Um, it could be whatever. And, you know, when we hear people say uh, that person's a really successful person, sometimes you hear this interesting expression, that person's a real self-made man. And I've always thought, that's really odd. Like, who is a self-made man or a self-made woman? Um, what, what exactly would that even be? Uh, listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. He says, what do you have that you did not receive. And then he goes on and says, if you then received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Great questions. What do you have that you did not receive? In other words, the self-made person, how is it that you had those opportunities? How is it that you, uh, did you choose where you were born? Did you choose when you were born? Did you choose your parents? No, none of those things did you choose or have anything to do with and yet they have so much to do with how you became a success. And all of those things came to you not by your own doing, but by the hand of God. One of the ways we can understand boasting is that it's taking credit for the gifts of God. That's what we do when we boast. We're taking credit for the gifts of God. We say, well, I worked so hard. Um, Yeah, well, where did your ability to work come from? So boasting is taking credit for the gifts of God. And let's think about this, a couple of ways that we might boast. If we're sitting in this chair, for example, we might be sitting in this chair and we're thinking, my life is about what I do. And um, and that's what it's all about. Well, boasting is a natural thing. It's a natural thing that we all do. But we might say, okay, one of the things we might be tempted to boast in is money. Because, yeah, I, I've been really smart with my money. I've been really, you know, a, a good steward of my money. Um, I've been successful in my career so that I can make money. Um, I haven't, and, and so when, when we're thinking about my focus is on what I do, then I'm thinking about myself and how that works. Or another one might be um, I'm thinking about my looks. Now, I might not be thinking about my looks. You might not be thinking about your looks, but some people do. You know, I'm looking attractive. I'm fit. I'm, I'm sexy. I'm beautiful. I'm well-dressed. Uh, it could be anything like that. And that's a lot of sometimes how we try to measure up and, and stack up against others. Or it could be success. It could be a number of things. All right? Now, that's what happens in this chair. The person sitting in this chair says... None of these things give me significance or worth. In fact, they give me a headache. And I'm constantly trying and trying and trying when I was in that situation to measure up 
But the person over here says, my significance and worth is absolutely settled by what he has done for me. Two very different chairs, as you see. Boasting. It says that boasting is excluded. The person in this chair, in the done chair, doesn't understand himself to be defined by what they do or any of these boasting things, but rather what they boast in is that I, marvel of marvels, I'm an object of God's kindness and love. How could that be? That's astounding. And that is what defines the person who sits in this chair. You know, another thing about boasting is that boasting and believing are really opposites. Um, they, they can't coexist uh, exactly. And here's another interesting thing about boasting. The Hebrew word for boasting is the word halal. And it, is, it plays into the, the phrase that we actually sang, um, that one word that you've all, the one Hebrew word that at least everybody would know, and that is hallelujah, halal. And the second half of hallelujah is the word for the Lord. So it literally means to boast in the Lord or give praise to. You see, when you boast, you are giving praise to something which is usually yourself through some means. So what God is encouraging us to do is to move from boasting in something that we do, but rather boasting in what he has done. And so he's saying that justification by faith excludes boasting. It severs the mortal blow, if you will, to boasting. Uh, we heard about it in the opening scripture. <laughs> Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this. That he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. And you know what's interesting? Some of you ladies who were a part of the recent Bible study in 2 Corinthians know. Famous verse in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 where he says, My grace is sufficient for you. For um, my, my, your grace is, is made clear in my weaknesses, and so I will boast all the more. And so Paul actually encourages boasting, but of a different type. He encourages boasting in our weaknesses because it amplifies the grace of God. In fact, here's another place in Galatians 6, 14. Paul says, far be it from me to boast. In other words, that's, a, that, that's my old life. That is what he used to do. He was really good at it. Um, he says, far be it from me to do that, and except, he says, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 6, 14, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So it's a totally different type of boasting. So believing in the gospel pulls the plug on boasting. Believing in the gospel changes how you see yourself. That's number one. Uh, revolutionary effect. Number two, revolutionary effect of justification by faith is that believing the gospel changes how you see others. It changes how you see others. It changes how you see yourself, number one. It also changes how you see others. Now, we see this in verses 29 to 30, where Paul says this, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised, that would be the Jews, by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith. So what we're seeing here is that Paul is teaching us is that how we see ourselves actually has an impact and a direct relationship to how we see others. How we see ourselves impacts how we see others. So in this case, it was Jews the descendants of Abraham, the Hebrews, the Israelites, and Gentiles, anybody who was not a descendant of Abraham, not a Jew, not an Israelite. And they had a very, I mean, we can hardly compare in our culture, though we have plenty of examples, uh, the division that existed between Jews and Gentiles and how strongly there was a hatred between them. And I think so much of that can be explained by it was how they saw themselves which then impacted how they saw the other. So um, it, it was very much, in fact, one of the effects is that it clearly divides the world into two people, us and them. And when I say them, I mean it like the way I said it, them. Uh, people who are different than us, people who have a different outlook 
um, about all kinds of things. In their case, it was, we are of a certain ethnicity, Hebrews, Jews, and those Gentiles are of a different ethnicity. It was a Dif- it was a division of ethnicity, or it could be a division, therefore, be on the basis of that, because of culture and beliefs. Uh, we, we practice this because we believe this, but they, they practice that because they believe that. Um, or it be a, a difference or division of practice. I mean, again, just all the things that we do. So here's what I want you to see about this, and that is that boasting, what we looked at in the first revolutionary effect of justification by faith, actually leads to judging. Boasting and judging go hand in hand. Um, I think you could say it like this, is that is that boasting and judging are cousins. Boasting and judging are inseparable cousins. Um, We won't boast without judging. You just can't do it. As soon as you begin to identify something in which you take pride in, you automatically, on the virtue, on the basis of that, uh, judge somebody else. Um, let's just take a look at this. You know, if if I'm sitting over here and it's all about what I do, then what that means is that I'm going to not just look at what I do and what I'm going to boast in, but I'm going to look at you in your chair. I'm going to look at you in your do chair or what I perceive to be your due chair, and I'm going to compare myself to you. I'm going to say to myself, okay, if I'm boasting in my education, then I'm going to look at your education and see how it measures up. If I'm boasting in my vocation, my career, I'm going to look at you and your career and see how we measure up. I can't boast without also judging. Boasting and judging are cousins. There's so many things that I sit in this chair, and that's, that's what happens when we sit in this chair, is that we look at others who are in a similar chair, and we ask ourselves, how do I measure up? You know what happens if you sit in this chair? And if the identity and understanding of who you are is in Christ and what he has done, is that you don't look at other people in their chairs, you look at Jesus in his chair, which is what? A throne. And then you understand, I'm, I'm at peace because of who he is and what he's done for me and the grace that he's given to me. Do you think there's any difference between this chair and this chair? Oh, everything changes. You see, believing the gospel impacts the way we either boast or change. We might, in that chair, even boast in things that we would perceive to be good, like family, Over here, we might say, I'm proud of the fact that I have a family, I have a spouse, I have children, I have this, and this is where we define and find worth and value and why I'm worthy of admiration and and respect. But over here, we say, no, 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 that's not the basis or the definition. Over here, we could even have pride in our religion and therefore, we could then, what, judge and look down on all the others who have some, don't have our religion. But that's, that's in that chair. In this chair, when it comes to our faith relationship with God and in Christ, we say, how, how is it that God showed mercy and grace to me and that I got to understand this? And everyone else is in the same situation as I am. They're no different. You see, as I said, boasting and judging are cousins, they're inseparable because they come from the same family. They're both descendants of pride, boasting and judging are. They're both descendants of pride. And, and, and here's an example of this. Jesus told the parable, you may be familiar with, of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And if you remember in that parable, <laughs> the Pharisee, it says he prayed thus to himself. He said, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He had someone in mind right there in his midst. And so what is he doing? He's judging. Well, if we go on to the next sentence, he says, I um, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of everything I get. That's what? That's boasting. You see, you don't boast without judging and boasting go hand in hand. They're cousins, both descendants of pride. What's pride? Well, C.S. Lewis in his excellent book, you know, Mere Christianity, says this about pride. He says, pride 
gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Indeed, pride is all about comparison. And maybe you've heard comparison is the thief of joy. It's so true. In fact, comparison, I'll just say, is a recipe for misery. And if there's fertile ground anywhere in our world for comparison that allows us to experience the recipe for misery, it's in social media. Because when you go on social media, you are not seeing the reality of what's happening in someone's life. You're seeing the highlights, right? And you're seeing the very best. And when you look at that, you compare. And you think to yourself, oh, what would it be like to have that experience? And so, boasting and judging, comparison, pride, this is, this is what is dealt the death blow by believing in the gospel, not operating out of what we do, but rather out of what God has done. It brings the death blow to it. You see, we no longer look at others and their chairs, but we look at Jesus in his chair, in his throne. Maybe you've heard the preaching point, which is said by a lot of preachers, and it's so true, and that is this, is that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You know, when you're looking up at Jesus, you can't look down at anybody else. And you realize that at the foot of the cross, we are all the same. We're all in the same boat, to use another metaphor. We, we, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You have no advantage over anybody else, nor do you have a disadvantage compared to anybody else. What did Paul say in the earlier part of this chapter? He said, no one is good. He says, no one is righteous. No, not one. He says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no distinction. In the opening part of the letter, in chapter 1, verse 16, he famously says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes first the Jew and then the Greek. In other words, there's just simply level ground at the foot of the cross. We do not have anything over or under anybody else. And so believing in the gospel deals a death blow to boasting and judging, and it absolutely changes the way you see others if you're operating out of this chair right here. By the way, as you have heard, if you've been around us at all, you know that our third of five core values is diverse community. And by diverse community, what we mean is that we desire to be a, a body that is one of people who are made up of many different types. Uh, diversity in ethnicity or race. Diversity in age, young and old. Diversity in socioeconomic. I celebrate the people who... Uh, became members of our church family this morning. It's a bit of a picture in some regard of that. And I praise God for how he's doing that in our midst. But that's what we mean by that. And that is that the gospel informs us of this, is that we are one in Christ, though different from each other. That's the second one. Believing the gospel changes how you see yourself. Believing the gospel changes how you see others. And third and last is that uh, the third uh, revolutionary effect of justification by faith, or the third way in which believing the gospel changes things, is it changes how you see God's law. It changes how you see God's law. Verse 31 says this. Look at it, if you will. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Now, let me just stop right there, because it would absolutely, 100%, seem like the answer to this question ought to be yes. I mean, Paul has been going over again and again. We have been saved apart from the law. Um, 
We've been justified by faith apart from the law, from the works of the law. In other words, he's been saying things that just seem like it's not the law, it's not the law, it's not the law. And so what does he say here? He asks this question. He says, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Wouldn't it seem like the obvious answer is yes, the law. I hate the law. I despise the law. And it's now overthrown. No. What he says here and it could not be more in fact, we kind of miss it in the translation here, but he says, by no means. Like, in other words, a translation would be, that's ludicrous. You've got to be kidding me. No, faith does not overthrow the law. He says, on the contrary, we uphold the law. This is a little surprising. And so that's what he's saying here is that it's upheld. Now, Ephesians 2, Paul says famously, for we have been saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is the gift of God. In other words, we've been saved by faith, not of works, um, lest anyone should boast, right? We've been talking about that. It is the gift of God. It's not on the basis of what we do. It's on the basis of what he has, what? Done lest anyone should boast. But he doesn't end there. Interestingly, in verse 10, having stated that as the foundation, he says, for we are created in Christ to do, hmm, interesting, to do good works, which he prepared for us in advance to do. That is to say, the things that we do no longer justify us but now we do things on the basis of his justifying us already. We no longer do this as a have to, but rather as a get to. It, it's changed our relationship with the law. The law used to be the, the measuring stick, but that has been snapped. And instead, the law is that which delights us because it is the will of the one who has saved us, who has shown mercy to us. And now it's completely transformed. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing, and that's what we see about what the gospel has done. I don't think there's any more clear way I could explain this than to share with you some words uh, that were written long ago by William Cooper, uh, a famous poet, Christian from England. And uh, what I'd like to do since I know they're going to show this to you, is I'm going to read some words that come before this, um, and then we'll read this last part that really sums it up. He wrote in a poem called Love Constraining Toward Obedience. These words. He says, How long beneath the law I lay in bondage and distress. I toiled the precept to obey, but toiled without success. Then to abstain from outward sin was more than I could do. Now, if I feel its power within, I feel I hate it too. What shall I do was then the word that I may worthier grow. What shall I render to the Lord is my inquiry now. And then he said these famous words, to see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. You see, what he's saying is that when you're sitting here, that which used to feel like uh, the slave who was trying to do the things that would um, acquire or procure the approval of God is not the case anymore because I'm no longer a slave, I'm a child. And that which used to feel like duty is now my delightful choice because he's put that into me. That's what happens when we believe the gospel. It changes the way we view God as not just the one that we must please, but rather the one who has chosen us and the one who has shown his grace and his kindness to us. And therefore, his will is something that we delight in. We embrace to do that, which is the will, the desire, the character, the heart of our Savior, the one who's shown grace to us. And so... That's the difference. You know, the irony of this is that the person who is saved apart from the law <laughs> um, loves the law more than the person who's trying to be saved by the law. How ironic, but it's so true.
And so, you know, what, what happens is that, you know, before we had this, this book, this Bible, and it was, oh, can't do it, can't do it. Oh, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing it here, I'm doing it here, I'm doing it better than you are. You should be doing it like I'm doing it. And we either feel pride or oh, I can never measure up. I'm just not as good as him, I'm just not as good as her. Or we feel despair. If my approach is it's based on what I do, that's how I approach this word, I'm going to hate this book or I'm going to take pride in this book because, look, I'm doing it. I have to lower the standards of this book to have any kind of sense that I might be able to do that. But if I sit in this chair, oh, my Savior, he loved me when I couldn't do it. He gave me the righteousness that I don't have. I'm unrighteous. I'm self-righteous. But I have a righteousness that has come not from me, but from him. It's on the basis of not what I did, but what he did. Oh, my Savior, what does your word tell me that's on your heart? That is your will. For I delight in you, and therefore I delight in your word. That's the difference when we go from this chair to this chair. That's the difference that the gospel makes when it comes to how we view God and how we view his law. It's good. It's our delight. It's not overthrown, but it's upheld, Paul says. So, to sum all this up, believing the gospel changes us. It changes how we see ourselves. And we don't have any interest, or at least it, I should say, let's be real, it diminishes our interest in boasting. And it's a constant fight because we still find ourselves magnetically drawn back to this chair. I do. But the gospel is changing that. It changes the way we see others. We find ourselves looking at others and comparing ourselves and judging and maybe disdaining or envying. But the gospel is changing and therefore we see that everyone else, even the most, from the earthly perspective, despicable person in the world is no different from me. We're made of the same stuff. Even the person who I consider to be the greatest and I feel like I can never measure up to, they're made of the same stuff. It changes the way I see others. And it changes, as I just showed you, the way we see God and the way we see his law. That's what it's doing. That's what it changes us. And so, I hope you can see, having looked at this, that justification by faith actually ignites a revolution inside the person who believes the gospel. So to conclude, again, I ask you this question. There are two chairs and we are all in one of these two chairs. Which one are you in? The do chair or the done chair? May by the grace of God, he firmly plants you in the done chair more and more for your pleasure and his glory. Let's pray.